Hello gamers and welcome back. I'm Rob, of course, or Shag if you want to call me by my in-game name. And another month has passed since the release of the Frozen Throne, which means another monthly meta. Uh, with that, for those of you who are unfamiliar with how we do this particular video, I'm going to go over all of all of the nine classes available to us and then dig a little bit deeper into each archetype and talk about what's uh, the most popular decks being played right now, uh, kind of what the deck does its uh, win condition, and if any changes to the decks have been made, and then also if anything in the deck list is kind of wonky or kind of um people have refined it even further i'll mention that in here as well uh keep in mind the dust count of all of these decks are in the bottom right and um if you have any questions comments or concerns feel free to leave that in the comment section below um but also keep in mind that all of these deck lists are mine so if there's a particular card or cards that you don't necessarily agree with feel free to take them out and replace them as you see fit but the core of the deck is what's important um the decks will always do what they're supposed to like kazakis priest which we have here um the goal of the deck is to play anduin raza kazakis get a lot of value from them then from there, Machine Gun Kelly, <laughs> your opponent down with your zero costing hero power. But whether or not you play the draw oriented version or the more value oriented version, it's kind of up to you. But the core of the deck is still Anduin, Raza, Kazakis, that kind of deal. So. Uh, this deck really hasn't changed that much. If anything, it's been refined further. Uh, there's a couple versions, like I mentioned just previously. Uh, there's more of a draw intensive version where you're just basically trying to draw into your Raza, Anduin, Kazakis, basically as fast as possible. And then there's a more value oriented version and even a combo oriented version that runs like Mind Blast, Elise. I've been able to fit Elise into here as well while keeping a lot of draw on the deck with Loot Hoarders and uh, the Loot Hoarder, Novice Engineer, stuff like that. Uh, this deck doesn't run the Alkalite because I found that card to be really kind of useful useless in this particular um, priest build because we're not a warrior we we're not able to deal one damage or you know have ravaging ghouls or whirlwind effects in this deck uh, most of the time the alkalite just dies to just whatever it only draws normally one card so i found that replacing it with like a novice engineer uh, was actually a lot more helpful because the novice engineer costs one mana, mana less uh, and it draws the card immediately so um this deck again really hasn't changed that much one or two cards to just make it even better than it normally was definitely tier one at the moment and uh, is found a lot on ladder most of the time if you're playing against priest it's either this particular priest deck um the kazakis priest or it's going to be this one here which is the rng fest priest or what people call it the big priest uh it has very little minions in the deck but it doesn't really need a lot because it revolves around being able to barns a minion and um when you barns, you're able to summon a 1-1 copy of the minion. From there, when it dies, you play Eternal Servitude. You bring the card back at full HP, full ability. And most of the time, uh, a lot of decks just can't deal with 8, 9, and 10 drop minions on turn 4, 5, and 6. And then the fact that this deck continues to be able to bring them back because uh, a lot of the time eternal servitude there's only two in the deck as you can only have two copies of a card but you've got shadow visions which can actually get you more eternal servitudes you also have shadow essence you also have uh the actual cards themselves you have free from amber there's just so many ways in this deck to generate giant minions very quickly um if you're able to pull barns and stuff like that and if not this deck has a lot of survivability uh, it has double dragon fire potion has holy nova has double greater healing it has the pine size potion shadow ward horror combo it's got potion of madnesses like this deck has a lot of early game tools to be able to if it doesn't draw barns or you know the shadow essence to be able to pull out a big minion it has the ability to survive until you can do those kinds of things um which is why which is what makes this deck so powerful it's very it's a very pricey deck there's a lot of legendaries there's a lot of uh high value minions um so definitely if you're a budget player this is not one of the decks that you want to build same thing with kazakis priest if we want to step back a bit further i think the dust count on here is even higher uh than the big priest yeah 1400 or 14k um so that's that's just that's a huge price pool so i feel bad for a lot of the free-to-play players out there who are trying to build these cool decks but unfortunately blizzard has put a quite a lock on the amount of money or and or packs you'd have to purchase and or buy with gold to get these uh, the next class we're going to talk about is going to be paladin uh, there's only two really popular priests right now i didn't mention dragon priest uh, because it's really just not that popular most of the time when you play priest it's going to be one of the two um, maybe you know five or less percent of the time it's going to be dragon priest but it's really not even worth mentioning uh, man my hair is a little fuzzy because of the background but it should when we change backgrounds the green screen does different things based on kind of like the background so i can't there's not a you know what i'm saying anyway paladin uh one of it was actually really popular prior to the um most recent changes but unfortunately due to 
uh, Jay Druid not being any popular, not being as popular, which was this deck was a uh, very good against it. Uh, also, the War Leader nerf, which wasn't huge, but still something that kind of took a little nick off the deck. Um, so with that, we don't really see a ton of the um, the Murloc Paladin anymore, but it's still a very powerful deck. I'm pretty sure if you ran this on ladder, you could get above 50% win rate. Um, I haven't seen a lot of it, but it doesn't mean it's not good. And um, this is the more tempo, fast pace oriented one. There's other ones that don't run Grim Scale Chum and stuff like that, and it caters to our, you know, Ragnaros the Light Lord, or maybe even Uther. Uh, but I found sometimes you're running the Paladin decks, especially the Murloc Paladins, um, to be very quick. You want to be able to finish off your opponent before it gets to the late game, and they play their DK because you don't have your DK in this deck. Um, so I found that uh, it's better to kind of run the more aggressive uh, Murloc Paladin if you're going to do it than the slower one due to the reason. I have just mentioned. Um, so uh, there's only that's the only really Paladin deck right now that's even viable to play, and, and most of the time Paladin's really not even that popular right now. So moving to Rogue, uh, there's quite a this is this is good stuff right here because there's quite a few uh, decent Rogue decks out there right now. Most of the time it's always been just one Rogue deck that's been very dominant, and then you have like a latent one in the back, but not that popular. Right now we've got basically three Rogue decks that, in my opinion, are very viable. We have the uh, Miracle Rogue, which we see here, which there's nothing really that's changed about the Miracle Rogue. Uh, every month that we've gone over this deck, it's basically the same review. Um, and if you don't know what Miracle Rogue is, I recommend like, watching an actual guide on it because it's a very uh, complicated, um, very, I don't want to say wonky, but there's... Each game is definitely going to be different, and then what you're trying to do is going to be different. Um, so it's a very complex deck in regards to each game playing out fairly different and kind of like the game plan of you getting there. Um, but I guess in a nutshell, you play Gadget and Auctioneer, there's a bunch of cheap spells. Your Arcane Giants cost very little. You can Valero or you can just play Arcane Giants and you win through big swing turns is kind of the best way to put it. But um, yeah. So the next one's going to be the Jade Rogue, uh, which in my opinion is a really fun deck to play. Maybe the least powerful and the least popular amongst uh, the Rogue decks that we are going to cover. Uh, but it's still a very, in my opinion, I really enjoyed this deck. It performs very well on ladder. I'm chilling, I think, just above 60% win rate with it. Granted, we don't play it a ton but whenever we do play it uh our opponents have no idea what it is until we've hit them with the jades and by then they're like all right well it's jade rogue it's a joke deck i can chill and then all of a sudden you're able to actually pump jades out quicker than a jade druid can with cards like shadow caster uh valera um, mimic pod jade shuriken and then all of a sudden your opponent's like holy shit what the hell just happened and then on top of there they have to worry about nazoth so it's just I think this deck takes people more so by surprise than it is actually like a powerful deck, but that still, it adds to the power of the deck if your opponent cannot play around it and they don't know what's in your deck. So uh, Jade Rogue, and I'm not going to explain too much in regards to Jades because we've been, <laughs> if you're watching this video, you've been around the block, you know what Jade does and um, you just create giant minions over the course of the game. So this next deck is actually very, very interesting in my opinion, because if we can remember back to a time about three or four months ago when Mean Streets came out, uh, which feels like a lifetime ago, I had actually uh, been hyping a Tempo Rogue list for quite some time. I had hit Legend with Tempo Rogue, I had it actually hit legend in the first four days of the season with this tempo rogue that i had built i had made a guide on it uh not a lot of people um it didn't really catch on and then it was actually brought to a tournament by uh a couple players and it did very very well and then it kind of died off from there and now that uh rogue actually has cards like um the bone mare and a couple of other tempo decks have stopped seeing as much play like Warrior, uh, this deck has actually come to light. Um, so what we have here is the updated and new Tempo Rogue uh, made popular by Asmo. This is um, this is my build, but his kind of, he, he brought this deck into the meta right now. Uh, so for those of you who hate this new Rogue deck, you can play Asmo uh, because he was playing this deck a ton. He hit rank one ledge with it multiple times. Again, not this exact deck list, this is my list. Um, but the, the core of it's the same Tempo Rogue. Um, it's basically you want to play a minion every turn, but what makes this deck really, really powerful is two things. Prince, uh, Kel'Thuzis, hopefully I'm saying that right, Kel'Thuzis. I have, you know what I'm saying. Um, you play that guy on two, and then you can shadow step him back to your hand and play him again. If, at that point, if you shadow step your prince, it's almost an automatic win for you. I don't care who you are. Most decks cannot deal with a plus two, plus two in all of your minion stats across the board. Even if you play prince once, it increases your win rate by tenfold. From there, you've got cards like Edwin, which can you can pump out a 12-12 Edwin on turn three or four, maybe even sooner, depending on your hand. You've got the uh, pirate package in here with South Sea Captain. 
swashes and uh, your Naga Corsairs. From there, you've got value generation tools like Cobalt Scalebane and the uh, Shadow Casters. And then from there, your late game kind of push is your Bone Mare. So there's a lot of different threats in this deck, a lot of oomph, and there's it curves out most of the time exceedingly well because we have a lot of one drops. Uh, we have only one two drop, but that doesn't matter because turn two, we can normally just hero power, which is pretty powerful. Uh, Turn three, most of the time, has South Sea, Captain Shaku, or SI. From there, we have good turn fours. Turn five is pretty big. Uh, turn six, not so much, but turn seven is Bone Mare, which is absolutely huge. Uh, so this deck is actually, in my opinion, very powerful. Uh, definitely low tier one, in my opinion, maybe top of tier two. I don't think, the only thing holding this deck right now is it wasn't, it hasn't been played. It was played by a few people a lot, but when it gets, get, gets played by a community as a whole and then we get hundreds of thousands of games under our belt with this deck it'll probably even get refined even further uh whether or not we're taking out a couple more cards and replacing them with a couple more cards and then from there i think this is can definitely be a tier one deck um depending on kind of how the meta shapes out and if uh, people continue to play it uh, our next deck that we're going to talk about is going to be the Huntard, <laughs> uh, a deck that a lot of people wanted to be uh, wanted to come back for a while now. It's actually a fairly good deck to use in tournaments. Uh, I don't recommend playing this. Like a Hunter's good on ladder. And this is my particular build of it. It's a little bit slower, but it beats control almost all of the time because of double call the wild Savannah High Main and Death Star Rexar. The problem with this deck is it loses to aggro, but the key is that we have double Galaka Crawler. A lot of the aggro decks are playing swash patches and things like that. Um, and we're also running double explosive shot. So the weakness of this deck is very aggressive decks like that rogue list, but we also have tools against that like Galaka and explosive trap. So um, it's not bad and um, recommending i would much i like i it's hard to say because i don't want to tell you not to play hunter on ladder because the deck can still win but the reason hunter right now exists in the meta is for tournaments because you if you can line your uh five decks up that you're playing a tournament and you can kind of snipe out which is what hunter would do uh one or two of your opponent's decks that you know hunter performs very well against uh like let's say quest mage or a slower jade druid and stuff like that you're easily able um to snipe those decks out get an easy win and move on and if you're like playing hunter and you get you know matched up with you know an aggro shaman uh or something like that you're gonna lose most of the time because this deck just cannot perform to the status of the aggro decks but you can line yourself up to do better against control decks so right now i think hunter is more of a tournament deck or a tournament class you should say uh because of the bands and um the fact that you can line uh, what deck you're playing versus what deck your opponent play your opponent's playing if you're a good tournament player uh, so moving on to the next one is going to be druid uh druid took a recent hit with the uh, nerfs. It had Innervate uh, being taken down to basically, it's a, a coin. I'm actually gonna hold on here, guys. I'm gonna see if I can fix my uh, camera because no matter what picture we're at, it like shows the fuzzies. So let's see if we can uh, casually move this over and do some of this, yeah. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. I was probably like, Rob, your head is sparkling. Change that shit before I leave. <laughs> so uh, we have the Jade Druid here. Uh, again, like I was mentioning, it, it took a hit with the Innervate and also took a hit with the Spreading Plague. In my opinion, Spreading Plague at six mana versus five mana, it's not a significant difference. The card is still very good and there's still play two of them per deck. Um, Innervate no longer fits into the deck because only gaining one mana crystals like having an extra coin this deck no longer needs to run Gadgetson Auctioneer because it has ultimate infestation because we don't need Gadgetson no longer need Innervate so we kind of took both of those out and ultimate infestation replaced Innervate and Gadgetson Auctioneer um, because it's a guaranteed draw summon a minion gain armor it's retarded the card's amazing uh, definitely run two of those uh, the rest of the Jade Druid has basically remained the same Mark of the Lotus it's basically you took out the Innervates and you took out the Gad Gadgetson Auctioneers and you replaced them with tech cards um, so I actually added in a Yogg because I like having an oh shit button I added Keeper Ogre Grove because I like a silence at least one in the deck I added um an Eater of Secrets because Quest Mage was very popular and Quest Mage destroyed Druid because of how slow it was. So if you add one Eater, that guarantees almost that you win against every Quest Mage you play against. And then we have a Mark of the Lotus because a lot of times I'll find myself spreading Plague and then my Plague doesn't live it like it, it does its job but it could do its job even better if we add mark of the lotus and we're able to buff you know two or three minions plus one plus one and that may not sound like a lot but it actually helps uh quite a bit and then on top of that um during the ultimate infestation when we want to remove cards from our hand we really want cheap cards innervate was great at that because we could innervate play two two cards and our uh, we could ultimate infestation innervate hero power innervate two one drops and uh mark of the lotus kind of just gives us 
room in our hand if we're going to overdraw with ultimate infestation which happens actually a lot in the late game because ultimate infestation just draws so many cards uh, moving on to the next deck we have the taunt druid or we could i honestly it's like a taunt slash token druid um I didn't include the aggro druid right now because it took a huge hit with innervate and um, a lot of the more aggressive druids kind of have left because they can't innervate innervate coin you know hydra or innervate innervate hydra or whatever they want to do um they they took a pretty sizable hit with that innervate uh jade druid's still powerful because it's always been a slow deck innervate made it faster but it's still a slow deck so it can handle and it didn't base its whole package off innervate meanwhile more aggro based decks being able to innervate out giant minions or buffs or whatever the case was a core part of the deck um so this is more of a uh, ramp into like living mana from there spreading plague bone mare malfurion ultimate infestation crip lord into like buffing your board um, so in my opinion, I think this is going to be the rendition of the deck that replaces the aggro druid into more of like a token style, you know, um, ramp oriented swarm the board, not so much play one giant minion and swing at your face. <laughs> um, so cool deck. I didn't include aggro because I included this deck, which is kind of the same thing. They have a lot of the same cards. There's a couple differences. This doesn't have Hydra. The other one does. But overall, it kind of goes for the same thing. And um, it's in my opinion this is a really good deck right now i played it on ladder uh, a little bit ago and i had I, I think i went like 10 and 2 with it um but uh yeah please don't play against me with that deck <laughs> I, I would not like to play be played against with that particular druid deck it is not it is not no no no, no. i don't want to see that deck so we're going to scroll off of that real quick uh, moving to Shaman. Um, also, let me mention uh, a Druid deck. Uh, we didn't cover Ramp Druid because, again, Ramp Druid, it was very prominent with Innervate. Not to say you can't play Ramp Druid, but it's just not popular right now. It was never really, really popular. Jade Druid, Aggro Druid were kind of the two most popular. <clears throat> and Ramp Druid was kind of back there, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the most prominent, which is why we're covering the most popular decks. I'm going to give you guys what, you know, 90 to 95% of what you're going to see, not that 1% to 2% that happens very not so often. I don't want to fill your brain with pointless stuff. So uh, next one's going to be the Evolve Shaman, or what I call it, the Pokemon Shaman, because the whole deck is revolving around you evolving minions. And what did Pokemons do? They evolve. I had a lot of questions on that. Um, so we replaced the 4-drop 7-7, seven, seven, which I had in my build, I believe, in the last uh, month uh, with Cobalt Scalebane. This is the re uh, the reason we want to do this, because the particular this particular deck revolves around playing a lot of small minions. Uh, small minions benefit off not only Evolve, uh, but cards like Flame Tongue, Totem, and Bloodlust, uh, and Cobalt Scalebane kind of adds to that because he gives one uh, minion on your side of the board at the end of the turn plus three attack it stays and he does it every single turn so he kind of turns your totems or your fireflies or whatever the case may be into minions in that actually do something that have high attack and need to be dealt with um, so there's a recent change there but besides that the deck has basically stayed the same over the course of the past couple months um, Again, just revolves around playing small minions, bloodlusting, doppelganger evolving into a very powerful board that has, you know, six, uh, three six drop minions that are, you know, bloodlusted. You bloodlust out and you win. Uh, not too much to explain here. I'm sure you've seen this deck quite a few times. Uh, a couple changes to it that made it even better, in my opinion, um, but overall, basically the same game plan. Moving to Mage, there's actually, I think, two or three uh, pretty prominent and powerful Mage decks at the moment. Uh, one of the better ones, in my opinion, is this particular Burn Mage. You can call it Control Mage. You can call it almost Fatigue Mage. It does all of these things. It can do all of these things, and it does it pretty well. Uh, Frostlich Chain is really, really good <laughs> against almost every single class. The ability to turn all of your elementals... Um, into lifesteal minions along with being able to sum, summon an elemental if you kill a minion with your hero power once you play her. Uh, that effect is absolutely insane. Uh, on top of that, you've got cards like Alex Draws and Medivh and Firelands Portal, which are just tons of value. And then the rest of the deck basically revolves around either you drawing, you sustaining yourself, you living, or you generating value. Um, so kind of like the top end of your deck is survivability leading up to the bottom half of your deck, which is kind of like your game plan, how you win, and how you outvalue your opponent. A couple cards that I do want to mention is Polymorph. Polymorph, Meteor, and Stulking. Uh, Stulking is in here because it's still... It 
the stalking is not only good against jade druid it is good against jade druid but it's also good against rogue because it gets rid of their hallucinations cold bloods depending on what kind of rogue they are it's good against priest gets rid of their pine size potion their power ward shields um their my their uh, potion of madnesses stuff like that so um it does well against multiple different decks which is why i've included it and uh the meteor i've included this can kind of take a spot of flame strike but i figured having two firelands portals for seven drops i kind of want to go meteor blizzard for six drops not not to say that you can't also play a flame strike if you really want to do that the next mage deck we're going to talk about is going to be the quest mage uh, ever since the tempo rogue and kind of hunter have taken off the quest mage has seen a lot less play we're talking i have seen maybe one quest mage in the past week and a half everybody is like this deck performs so so bad against aggro decks like this deck almost in my opinion loses 90 percent of the time versus aggro decks because it just doesn't have the tools in the early game it doesn't run volcanic potion it doesn't run frostbolt it doesn't run um the what is it called the valet um so there's a lot of things it doesn't run flame strike or meteor um so there's just a lot of cards in this deck that revolve around beating control decks which is what this deck does this deck destroys control decks you play against an azoth warrior uh priest you play against jade druid stuff like that this deck loves it farms those guys very high win rates but against aggro it loses what's popular right now aggro so what does quest mage do vanishes for a little bit until the control meta comes back uh we saw a very very control-esque meta prior to the nerf now aggro is creeping back up on us so that's why the quest mage isn't as popular but it's still a deck that you need to be aware of and it's still out there creeping the next deck is actually going to be a deck that popped up recently uh, i didn't think it would it's a weird deck to pop up recently but it kind of i guess it combats the tempo rogue it's this the tempo mage uh, i was coaching a few people recently and we've played quite a few tempo mages and then i i, went, I hopped on ladder for a little bit uh, over the past couple days and i played a, quite a few tempo mages as well uh, their builds similarly looked like this i haven't been able to actually test the deck myself so this is just the build this is my first rendition of the deck and how i would build it it would probably change over the course of me playing it but it's a deck that's been popping up um so you now you've got to worry about three different mage decks whether it's quest mage control mage or uh, tempo mage and all of them uh go across the board right which is makes it makes it very difficult to mulligan against because if you mulligan for control and it's aggro you get punished if you mulligan if it's for aggro and it's control you get punished so it's one of those things that um kind of knowing what's more popular at a specific time uh, would really help you out. I would have to say this is probably, um, Control Mage is probably the most popular, followed by this Tempo Mage, and then the Quest Mage being last. But again, it all depends on your rank and what people, what basically streamers are playing. You know, if Disguised Toast or Kibler is playing a Quest Mage and he's 5-0, and oh, you better believe there's a lot of Quest Mage on ladder because people are like, oh, I gotta play it too. He's doing good. I can do good too. <laughs> so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, moving to warrior this is definitely not a very popular deck right now but i wanted to include it um just because i knew if i didn't include pirate warrior people would be like rob you forgot pirate warrior where is it at <laughs> um the thing pirate the the reason why pirate warrior is not very popular i haven't played against a single pirate warrior since the nerf actually a lot i played against one and this is the one i played against is because fiery war axe received a nerf bringing it down to three mana and that really hurts this deck a lot fiery war axe was one of the most powerful cards in the deck and because of that uh, people actually have substituted out Fiery War Axe in replace. Uh, actually, have not substituted Fiery War Axe out, but substituted all two drops out because Fiery War Axe is no longer a two drop and played Prince. So now the Pirate Warriors have be they they they're. They're, they're picking up steam they become smart they become self-aware um that they have a lot of charge minions and charge minions benefit greatly off plus one plus one in stats so now instead of worrying about a four three core crown elite you have to worry about a five four core crown elite because they have played prince and they've run no other two drops uh they don't really need the south sea uh, uh she was a two drop two three your weapon benefits off or she benefits off your weapon she's a fantastic card but I think Prince in replace of her is a pretty good move. And it still runs War Axe. It still runs a lot of stuff. It actually is a little bit more in the heavy side now because you're able to run uh, Mortal Strikes. Uh, Heroic Strikes also out. We replace that, like I mentioned, with the Mortal Strikes. It runs Leroy and Captain Greenscreen along with the Arcanite Reapers and Naga Corsairs. Um, so we chilling in regards to some high-end minions that generate either more weapons or buff buffing your weapons or can charge face and a 7-3 uh, Leroy is always scarier than a 6-2 Leroy. Uh, moving on to the next one, there's actually two decks I wanted to mention here. That we have the Taunt Warrior, which is what we have here, the Quest Warrior, and then there's also a Nazoth Warrior or a Fatigue Warrior, uh, which 
I didn't want to include all of those because they all basically fall under the same category of a control warrior. So I've included the most popular of what I think um, are among those because a lot of people, um, they're playing the fatigue warrior deck in tournaments. It does well in tournaments and it does well on ladder sometimes. But the thing is, it's a very hard deck to play and it's countered fairly easily with aggro decks because it's not the fatigue war or the yeah the fatigue warrior dogs fatigue warrior in specific is built to destroy other mid-range to control decks it's not built to destroy aggro and right now aggro is very popular very similar to the quest mage it kind of disappears so if there's a lot of people running quest uh, or the fatigue warrior it's first of all it's a very hard deck to play so a lot of people fucking suck with it <laughs> but the other thing is it does very poor against like i said uh very aggressive decks so I think the Taunt Warrior out of all of them are kind of like the most popular of the Control Warriors right now. There's also the Nizoth Warrior that I just made my deck guide on. A lot of people saying they've been playing it and loving it. Um, but it's also, I have yet to play against a single other Nizoth Warrior on ladder in the past like three months. <laughs> Besides me, I think I, I was like the only one playing it at the time. Um, so uh, I didn't want to include that. Quest Warriors probably, you know, it's going to be Pirate or Quest. It could be Fatigue, but at the same time, just know that it's going to run almost the same way as any other Control Warrior, other than the fact that it's trying to fatigue you, which means get all of the cards out of your deck. But if you're running aggro or, or mid range, you stand a pretty good chance against it. And uh, on top of that, it's a really hard deck to describe. You, there's no way you can I can recover a deck as complicated as a fatigue warrior in, in, in you know 40 minutes that this whole video takes up. That that deck would solely take 40 minutes just to cover like one strategy. Um, moving to warlock, we have the handlock. This is my particular. This is my current uh, handlock list. Uh, I've modified it quite a bit. Um, with this new meta, uh, I've changed quite a few cards in regards to adding a silence, taking out a faceless shambler, putting in some tar creepers, uh, taking out the blood mage. So there's a lot of tweaking I've done. I still like the blood reaver and the Lord Draxus in the deck. If you care to be like Rob, why have you built it the way you've built it? I suggest watching the deck guide I did on this deck where I go into detail about why I've included what I've included. And if there is discrepancies in between this deck list and my deck guide one, just know use this deck list but follow the same strategies as the deck guide. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar with Handlock, this deck revolves around being able to stall the early game with cards like Tar Creeper, Doomsayer, Defile, things like that. From there, you play cards like Twilight Drake and the, um, where is he? Mountain Giant on turn four or five. Huge minions, very powerful. From there, you have a very solid late game of Abyssal Enforcer, Stolking Geese, or Siphon Soul, depending on you, what the situation you find yourself in. From there, being able to drop uh, Double Twisting is come in so handy because it's basically an oh shit button if you know me i love oh shit buttons i like being able to play a card and my opponent has overextended on the board um we punish them and if not we can use one twisting nether but there's two of them in the deck so they're like oh shit he used twisting nether pretty early on on not the greatest of boards i'm gonna flood the board now then you drop the second twisting nether and like are you kidding me holy shit this guy is next level uh from there you drop lord draxus and or blood reaver guldan and you just destroy your opponent either through value or just from a hero power that that deals three damage and heals you for three. Fantastic deck, very fun to play, one of my favorites. Moving to the next deck, which is very interesting in my opinion, the Zoo Warlock. Uh, recently, Trump and a few other uh, streamers were playing, uh, not this particular deck, but again, a rendition of a Zoo-like, you know, deck. Um, if you look, it looks, it has almost the same exact game plan and strategy as the Tempo Rogue, but instead of a hero power that makes a weapon, we actually have a hero power that allows us to draw more cards, which is one of the biggest weaknesses of um, Tempo Rogue's Pirate Warriors is the fact that they have no card draw. They have no cards in the deck that generate value. They don't need to. Each card is good on its own, and they kill their opponent with just the cards they have with drawing one per turn. Uh, but this deck actually has the ability to play a ton of one drops, and uh, get those cards out, swarm the board, and keep hero powering to be able to refill their hand. And they're able to do this because most of the time your opponent's worried about dealing with the board state instead of your life points. Because if they don't deal with the board state, they'll just lose the game on the spot. So what is this deck weak to? Mage. You know, Mage continuously freezes the board, stalls the game, and if you're tapping, they can actually kill you, uh, kill you just directly without even really having to deal with the board state that often. What makes this deck particularly powerful is the re uh, Blood Reaver, Gul'dan, and Sea Giant, in my opinion. Um, the ability to throw up on the board, benefit through Sea Giant, or and or if they kill a lot of your demons, uh, Blood Reaver, Gul'dan will actually bring them back, and most of the time you can get five to seven minions from your Blood Reaver, and you can draw him quite consistently because, again, your hero power allows us to draw a like 
almost every single turn, uh, if not every other turn, because the minions in this deck are so cheap, they're so powerful, and you can cycle quite quick, cycle quite nicely. So with that, um, that wraps up our month, our monthly meta of the most popular decks. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. If I happen to leave anything out, let me know, uh, and uh, I'll include it in next month monthly meta. But again, I didn't want to. I want to include what you're going to see 90 to 95 percent of the time. If you're you know missing out on your Nazoth you know, control shaman deck or jade control shaman deck. I didn't include it because it's not popular. Not to say it's not good. It's just I can't. If I were to go over every single deck being played. It would take me like five hours and you would be playing around everything that doesn't matter you want to you want to go with what's statistically most probable when playing this game so with that thanks for watching i'll catch you in the next episode of course i'm robert warshak and happy whatever the hell day